we resume our meeting with uh, the third uh, panel. The third panel will deal with uh, the climate policy and energy union, and I'm very happy that uh, the vice president of the European uh, Commission, Mr. Maro Maros Shevkovic, who is also responsible for these issues, is here this afternoon with us. Welcome, uh, Vice President, Thank to you. our panels. I would also like to welcome uh, Monika Langdaler. She is the director of the R20 regions of uh, Climate Action Austrian World Summit in uh, Vienna in May uh, this uh, year. And she is also a long-term uh, member of the Austrian National uh, Council. So also welcome uh, to our session. And we are looking forward uh, to your statement. Without uh, any further ado, I would like to start our panels. Uh, Mr. Shevkovic uh, will give us an introduction, and I have uh, to add that uh, Mr. Shevkovic has, has uh, to leave uh, by 4 o'clock. So uh, please uh, have a look on your watch uh, when we have the discussions so he can answer all the questions raised uh, during the panel uh, session. Mr. Vice President, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished uh, members of national and European parliaments, uh, dear Monica. It's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, I remember that I was a uh, very regular and very frequent uh, guest uh, to the COSAC discussions when I was responsible for interinstitutional affairs. So it's a pleasure to be back uh, uh, at the time where uh, we can already take uh, such a first assessment uh, uh, how we did in this uh, very important strive uh, to clean up our planet, to decarbonize our economies, to tackle climate change and to modernize our economy. How we been successful in introducing the energy union in Europe. And I'm of course uh, very glad that we will share the speaking time together with Monica because we are working together on uh, many projects, uh, especially in Africa, to make sure that uh, we will fund the projects uh, which are very important for the people on the ground, which would allow them to get basic access to electricity through new, modern, clean means of electricity production like microgrids and solar panels. And of course, the fact that Arnold Schwarzenegger is the president of R20 helps a lot because uh, it's uh, not only the attention we get, but also his energy, his vision and support, uh, which we feel uh, very much in all the practical implementations of our common policies. When I was here uh, the last time, at that time I was uh, presenting you the idea of uh, the energy union. It was uh, four years ago. At that time, the energy union was a vision I'm very glad that I can say that we developed it into the strategy. We uh, developed very concrete uh, action plan. And today I, I'm very happy to say that Energy Union is becoming reality. And it's uh, not only the reflection of different elaborated uh, legal text uh, which help us to increase energy security in uh, especially Central and Eastern Europe, which uh, uh, led us to create true internal energy market and make sure that we would have this free flow of energies across uh, the, the European borders, but also to put focus on energy efficiency, the first source uh, of energy supplies, uh, on making sure that we would look at the climate change, not only as uh, a challenge, but also the opportunity to modernize and decarbonize our economies, but also as a motivation to invest more in um, research and innovation. What I think would be probably the, the most uh, 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 known or visible legacy would be the package which is currently being finalized thanks to the excellent work of uh, Austrian presidency and the package uh, which we presented uh, as a clean energy for all uh, Europeans. Finally, um, we are now in the final stages on the remaining uh, pieces of the legislation which very much focus on the new electricity market design 
on the new rule of uh, uh, new role of uh, European regulators, and also on the closer cooperation with our member states, uh, because energy union cannot be just built on the papers or in Brussels. We have to build it in our countries, in our cities, in our industry, and we have to translate that Paris uh, ambition and European vision in very concrete national strategies, how Austria, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, wants to picture themselves in 2030 and beyond. What kind of energy mix they want to have, what kind of uh, reforms uh, in, this, uh, in this respect uh, they are ready to accomplish. I have to say that, uh, that positive developments over the last uh, few years led to the situation where the Member States and European Parliament have uh, been even more ambitious than our leaders when presenting national commitments uh, uh, to uh, Paris negotiations, or even more ambitious than the Commission when we've been proposing the targets for 2030 for renewables or for energy efficiency. I'm sure that uh, you noticed uh, that what was final agreement of the legislator, meaning the Member States and the European Parliament, is that by 2030 we should have 32.5% uh, 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 of uh, uh, energy efficiency and 32% of renewables in our energy mix, which is more than what we uh, presented uh, by the Commission or by the leaders uh, before Paris negotiations. So what this would mean in practice? In practice it would mean that uh, we would uh, overachieve uh, our goal to reduce greenhouse gas emission in 2030 by 40% uh, because I believe that with this new ambition in renewables and energy efficiency, we would be reducing greenhouse gas emission in Europe at least by 45%. And it's not important only for the planet, it's also very important uh, from the point of view which uh, we also discussed the last time when we had a chance to debate uh, on this with the Governor Schwarzenegger, and this was the issue of health, of air pollution in our cities, respiratory diseases of uh, our children, simply making our cities more livable and uh, more healthy. This is, I think, clear proof that uh, when we look at uh, these reforms and at uh, the, the uh, climate change from this perspective, we see what kind of motivation uh, it serves for innovating, for bringing new uh, technologies and new solutions to the European economy. One of the imperatives brought uh, by air pollution, by the pressure of our mayors and citizens, uh, was uh, the push for cleaner mobility. And it's quite obvious uh, that we need to do much more in electromobility. We need to do much more making sure that we would master the technology on manufacturing not only the best cars on the planet here in Europe, but also best, greenest, most sustainable batteries on this planet as well. We expect that as of 2025, the market uh, for batteries would represent 250 billion euros annually. And I think that uh, if we put it into the proper, uh, proper perspective, this represents for example, the whole economy of the country like Hungary. And we just simply cannot accept the fact that all this market would be captured by somebody else and not by Europeans. We have to fight for it and we have to make right choices and right investment. I expect that uh, by the end of the next decade we will have in Europe somewhere between 25 to 35 million electric cars. In the world, the International Energy Agency expects that would be 125 million of these vehicles in Europe, being an export-oriented uh, economy, has to be very strong in this new segment, in these uh, new goods which are so much demanded uh, on the market. Therefore, we established this European Alliance for Batteries, uh, where currently we have two, 260 leading uh, European uh, uh, companies working together. In one year, the investors accumulated more than 100 billion of euros of ongoing or planned investments, and I believe that this would lead uh, to what we need to cover the expected amounts, and this would, this would be opening somewhere between 10 to 20 gigafactories here in Europe. We want to make sure that uh, 
the new technologies which, are going, which we are going to promote with electromobility would be fully compatible with our new electricity market design and that we want to make sure that the raw materials they use would be from sustainable sources, that we would use recycling and reuse uh, in um, the much better organized way and that the software which will be managing these batteries uh, will be uh, developed in a way that it would not only power the car but it would help us to use the battery capacity as an energy storage, as a balancing tool and it could uh, be used for selling uh, not needed uh, energy from the battery back to the grid and hopefully earn the owner of this new e-car also some additional money. We believe that this would really uh, bring a lot of innovation, new change and new development in European economy. But of course, we have also professions and the regions uh, which are looking into the future with a lot of anxiety. Here I'm talking about uh, the coal regions of Europe. We have 41 of them uh, in uh, the European Union and uh, we have 200,000 people who work in coal or coal related industries. And what I think is very important is uh, uh, to be very open uh, with the leaders of these regions uh, that we are not going to abandon it. That we've been working in very difficult professions for many, many decades and now it's our societal duty to work with you for the next stage, for the new economic development and bring new economic activities into your region. We established the coal platform uh, for uh, carbon intensive regions in transition, but currently we are working closely with seven member states and we again try to make the work of this platform as simple as possible. Let's discuss together. Let's use the expertise of uh, the member states of the European Commission Let's model what could be the new economic activity for the concrete regions. If we agree on the vision, let's discuss what kind of projects can bring us to that vision. And we, if we have agreement on that, let's look together for the money, for the financing. What can we do with the EU funds? How can we reprogram, reallocate, uh, uh, or better uh, channel the European support? how much money we can get from different horizontal programs like LIFE or Globalization Fund, or where we can use the help of European Investment Bank or different international investors who are ready to invest if the projects are good. I think that this would be something which will be very important, not only for now, but also for the future financial perspective. And I hope that together with the legislator, we will find a way how we can finance this very important part of uh, the European economic uh, transition. I think that it's uh, very symbolic to mention it together with the latest report which we got uh, from the uh, IPCC. Because despite the efforts I just uh, described and despite the leading role that Europe play in tackling the climate change, scientists gave us very clear signal that we are still not doing enough and we have to do much more if we want to stick closer to the 1.5 degrees of overheating of our planet to prevent uh, the global disasters which would put in peril our children and grandchildren. In this in mind and uh, uh, reacting to the clear uh, invitation from the European heads of states and government, uh, European Commission uh, is currently finalizing the new vision paper document how to make Europe carbon neutral by the second half of this century. What does it take to do it? What could be the different scenarios, different technologies? What would be the cost related uh, to this transformation? As I said, we will prepare, we will present the document by the end uh, of November. Uh, one lesson is clear already right now that uh, every single sector, transport, agriculture, energy production, and uh, building, co uh, construction of, uh, uh, of our uh, infrastructure networks will be uh, affected by this document because we will need to look for all pockets of energy efficiency gains uh, we can find to make sure that we will, we will bring the transformation and change uh, uh, which is needed. All this I think would be very important uh, because uh, we are going through very turbulent times in Europe as you discussed also this morning. The European Union is challenged uh, uh, 
uh, by uh, outside uh, powers. So even in some cases, the powers which have been traditionally considered as our closest uh, allies. The European cooperation is also challenged from within. And therefore, we just need uh, to present uh, to our citizens the solutions which would be concrete, which would restore the pride into the European project, and uh, which would make sure that uh, we will adopt uh, the right decision. Because working on industrial policy, I'm absolutely convinced that the next decade will decide if the century would be American or Chinese or European one. And I think that it should be our natural ambition that this century should be as European as possible. That we have all ingredients to succeed. We have public support for our policies. We have great youth which is ready to adapt and adjust to the uh, permanently changing uh, working environment brought by globalization. And we have to use this energy and to give our youth the opportunity to be best prepared labor force on this planet. And I believe that with these ingredients, the Europe uh, will be definitely on the par with the US, with China, and uh, we know how much this would be appreciated in the third world, because we are not thinking only about us, we are very responsible in cooperating with the continents like Africa, with the countries like India and others where we know that we need uh, to share our knowledge and experience to make sure that their economic development would be much cleaner than ours was for the last 150 years. So with uh, these introductory remarks, I really would like to thank you very much for the support of your national parliaments, for all transformative pieces of legislation we presented uh, to you and which you discussed in your national parliaments. Uh, and to thank you for the support because without your support we wouldn't be at that advanced stage of uh, building up of the energy union and we would need very much that cooperative spirit not only until the end of a great Austrian presidency but especially in the next years where all this legislation would be put uh, into the proper implementation so thank you once more in advance for close cooperation thank you Thank you very much, uh, Vice President, for your keynote address. Uh, I will now give the floor to Monika Langtaler. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for having me here. I brought some slides, and I would ask the organizers maybe to put them on the screen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, organizers, screen, slide. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it makes it more easy for me to get you all on the same page when we are discussing this issue about energy access, about climate change, about the challenges ahead. And the first slide I brought with me is one you might all know. It's an annual report from the World Economic Forum about the global risks, risks we are all facing in the world. And for the last years, it always have been risks which are connected to climate change, extreme weather events, natural disasters, and failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation. So that's what we are facing at the moment. And you all know that, of course, from television, from the newspapers. We just see it currently still in California, what's happening. Natural disasters, which are not only completely relied to climate change, but very much they are in the consequences. When we talk about energy and Commissioner Shevkovich already mentioned that, and I have to thank you, Commissioner, for the great cooperation we have with you and your, uh, your team in Brussels. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a real fan of yourself. This is really true. And I can bring you my best wishes from him for you and your work for the next weeks, especially for Katowice. When we face the challenges in the energy system, we know it is the climate change issue, which of course is one of the important challenges in history for us. But it is also access to electricity for many, many people in the world which don't have electricity. It used to be a high number, 1.5 billion. I will come to that in a minute. And of course, increasing air pollution in cities. Air pollution in cities, mega cities, mainly in countries which maybe are not in Europe, but you face it, of course, in Paris, in London, and in other cities, you're still growing a lot. Last week, we had here in Vienna the 
the, the, the presentation of the international energy outlook from the International Energy Agency. And what they showed us are different and mixed signals we get from the energy market and the energy system. And I only want to highlight two here. This is that the CO2 emissions are again reaching an historic high in this year in 2018. That is the bad news, but we do have a good news. And this is that for the first time, the global population without access to electricity fell below one billion. And this is interesting in many, uh, many folds because it is not only because uh, we do have investments in poorer countries. We see that especially this uh, lower number is due to the Indian policy. India uh, was able with their vision they had for the last 15 years to supply for 400 million people, especially from rural and poorer uh, regions, to supply them with electricity, mainly renewable electricity. We do have a huge problem in Africa. The commissioner mentioned that already, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. The, uh, it, it, it gets worse there, not better. So we do have a lot of responsibility there, especially as being European countries, which are so close to Africa. Some very quick slides regarding the energy demand. Look at that slide. It's not surprising that in the year 2000, the number one was the USA with largest energy demand. European Union being on the second place, China on the third. But look at the next slide. Only 17 years later, and we do know that energy systems are Big system, it is very difficult to shift them. But look at that, China just doubled not only the energy demand, but of course also CO2 emissions. We do have the United States on the second place, European Union on the third, and India, look at the figures of India, it just doubled in the last 17 years. And the outlook for 2040, look at that. Still China, of course, in the lead. China growing, 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 still growing. United States staying on the same amount of energy demand as they are today, but look at India. It's again doubling, and it's already number three regarding energy demand, followed by Africa. European Union being on the fifth place, which is a good signal. It's not meaning, oh, we are going, uh, falling back. No, this is good, because this does mean, and the figures means also that it is not with a loss of welfare. It is not with a loss of production ability. It is just because European legislation, hopefully, as the commissioner just put it on the table, will be implemented and that we will be much more efficient than other countries will be. But we see we do have an issue there. Energy demand is still growing. CO2 emissions will grow. So we are far away from stabilizing the system. And one slide, which I especially brought for you as politicians, as being those who are on the driving wheels. We do have enormous amount of need for investments in the energy system. The International Energy Agency speaks about two trillion every year. And most of these investments are absolutely governmental driven. So it's your turn, it's the politicians who need to do the proper regulations and the proper uh, laws for having this shift from a fossil fuels, fuel based uh, energy system to a more renewable system. And you might think, and the chairman said that at the beginning, why do we need a new conference, another climate conference? We do have so many already. My boss is Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm working for Arnold Schwarzenegger now for the last six years. And together with the Austrian federal president, Alexander van der Bellen, we initiated a summit which is called the R20 Austrian World Summit. It is a summit and I want to show you a few impressions, which is dedicated to best practice. Have a look, please.
So what is it what we are doing and where we want to invite you to join us with this movement? It is a conference and an initiative dedicated to optimism, dedicated to something which we must do to reach the people out of this bubble. We are here, you are here in a, some sort of bubble where it's getting more and more difficult to reach out to the people and to convince them that we need to act. So this summit is about convincing people because too often we act like we are losing the battle of fossil fuels. Too often we play defense instead of offense and this is wrong. We will go and we need to go on the offensive. We say to the defenders of the old order, you cannot hide from the future. We are no longer the victim, we are the victor. So ladies and gentlemen, as the commission already mentioned, we have a huge challenge ahead, but I'm sure and convinced that together we can do it because it is time for action. As my boss always says, it's time for less whining and more action. And it is time for doing and not only talking. To be confident is not misplaced. All over the world, and this is very much what we are doing in the cities and states, in colleges, in the NGO sector, in the universities, in nonprofit organizations, we are already winning ground and we are convincing people. So if there are leaders who might not yet join us, we do have already many, many who are on the same page and who are doing a lot and we need the power. We are from the R20, the R is for regions 20. We are a subnational organization. And we are convinced that we need the power of the cities, the regions and the states who control 70% of the emissions. And at the sub-national level, there are so many great success stories already. Let me just share two examples with you because we are here in Austria. Uh, in Lower Austria, which is quite next to Vienna, we achieved already 100% of renewable electricity already in 2015. Or here in the city of Vienna, a beautiful city, it is again the most livable city in the world, maybe not today because it's a little bit foggy and a, bit, a little bit cold for you, but because also of the good environment here, an excellent waste management system, the public transport system, it is why it's always ranked in the really, really high livable city in the world. Or take California, where Governor Jerry Brown has continued the landmark policies and environmental goals that Governor Schwarzenegger fought for as a governor, and Governor Brown even aimed higher. California is now on track to hit the goal of 50% renewables a full decade earlier than they thought they would be, and business is booming in California. California's economic growth beats the United States GDP growth. So there are already a lot of success stories. And that's what we are doing with the R20 Austrian World Summit. We have three steps for us, which we are following. First step is winning the communications war, how we call it. Arnold Schwarzenegger always says, you can have the best product in the world. If you can't communicate it, you have nothing. And that's very, very true. Climate change, as we all know, is a serious threat, but we cannot be stuck only talking about sea level rise or ice bears jumping around or temperatures changing because we can't reach the people for that. All of these things are serious threats, but it happens down the line. The human brain, and you might know it as people who are working with their constituencies, the human brain is wired to focus on immediate threats on the here and on the now. The people who are voting for you will ask you, what are you doing now and not in 15 or 20 years? So what is going on now? Right now, nine out of 10 people breathe polluted air. Right now, pollution kills nine million people every single year. It kills three times as many people as HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. It kills 15 times as many people as all wars, murders, suicides, and every form of violence. That's what pollution causes in the world at this moment. And that's what we should be talking about. Not the tragedy, com not the tragedy coming in 30, 40, or 15 years, the things which are just happen now. Our second step and second aim is sharing our ideas with each other 
around the world, different cities, regions, states, they are doing already fantastic work. But no one and no one needs to reinvent the wheel every day. So the blueprints are out there waiting to be copied and we want to showcase that and we are doing that every year at our R20 Austrian World Summit. The third step is funding clean energy projects around the world. There are leaders around the world who have shovel-ready projects, green projects, but they don't have the funding for it. At the same time, there are investors hungry for clean projects, but they can't find the projects. And that is why R20 and also the commissioner mentioned that, where we're working together for an R20 subnational fund for Africa, where we invite investors and where we prepare bankable projects to invest in green infrastructure projects. So it's our job to connect the smart money with the smart projects. So it's communication, sharing policies, showing best practice examples and role models, and keep investing in the future, and then we all will win. The commissioner also said that we are at one of the great turning points in human history, and I think we all agree it's one thing is climate change, it's digitalization, it's innovation, and they're all interconnected. We live in an interconnected, globalized world. And all of us who gathered here today to hopefully know which side of history we are on. And you all choose on which side you are. The losing and pollution past, or the winning clean future. So today, and hopefully in only two weeks at the COP24 in Katowice in Poland, we will choose a world powered by green energy, and we will choose, therefore, a good future. We choose to win, we choose to make, hopefully, the planet great again. And I all want to invite you to join us at this journey and to see you soon in Vienna. And my last slide is that we hope that we see you at our R20 Austrian World Summit, 28th of May 2019, in the Viennese Hofburg, together with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Federal President Alexander van der Bellen, and Chancellor Sebastian Kurz. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Monika Langtaler for her presentation. Uh, she mentioned in her presentation Arnold Schwarzenegger who is a strong voice uh, for a smart and uh, clever energy policy, uh, not only uh, for Europe, but worldwide. And uh, I would like uh, to say that he is uh, a good uh, friend of us, uh, Renato Batka and me, because he was born in uh, Styria in <laughs> Steiermark. So we are proud that Arnold Schwarzenegger is contributing a lot for a clever uh, environment uh, worldwide. We will uh, start our debate uh, now. Uh, we have uh, 28 participants. Uh, we have 29 participants in our debate. So I would like uh, to hold uh, your individual uh, remarks within one and a half uh, minutes. I have to give you some uh, technical information. First, uh, Vice President uh, Shevkovic has to leave by four o'clock. So we uh, will take the first, uh, the first three to four uh, speakers uh, and he will answer uh, these speakers and uh, leave uh, afterwards. And I have uh, to give you the technical information that uh, the first bus will not leave at uh, four o'clock. Uh, he will leave uh, by the end uh, of uh, panel uh, three this uh, afternoon. And, uh, after this panel, as you know, uh, we have the chairperson's uh, COSAC uh, meeting in this uh, room. So the first uh, speaker will be uh, Asa Westlund. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Commissioner Sefcovic and uh, Mrs. Langtaler for an excellent uh, initial part of this session with a good overview and very inspiring words. Through the EU, we have been able to make a number of joint decisions on measures which have benefited the climate. However, it remains very clear that we need to do more. We need to go in the forefront for climate change, to encourage other global actors to follow suit. 
And just as Commissioner Sefcovic mentioned, we need to strengthen our competitiveness as a result of doing this. It's now, for the next 10, 20 years, that we hold everything in our hand. We can avoid some of the worst effects of climate change. We're coming very close to a temperature increase of 1.5 degrees. And uh, very recently, many people have experienced consequences of climate change with heat waves and floodings, etc. And it underlines the importance of uh, reaching not just the two degree target, but in fact the 1.5 degree target even, because the IPPC report very recently showed that there is a big difference between 1.5 and two degrees of a temperature increase. And if we want to save future generations and ourselves as we grow older from some of the worst effects of climate change, it is now that we need to step up the pace. Does Commissioner Sepkovic believe that it's impossible to have such a discussion in, in addition to having good implementation in place? Thanks very much. Uh, the next speaker is from the European Parliament, Lukas Mandel. Thanks also from my side, Honorable Vice President, colleagues. Christian Buchmann and Reinhold Lopatka, and uh, as an Austrian member of European Parliament, I thank all of you for visiting Vienna on this occasion during our presidency. I hope you can also enjoy our town, which has pretty clean air, something Monika Langthaler was already talking about. And thank you, Monika, also for drawing the attention on Vienna as a place where the R20 summit takes place each and every year. Uh, which means uh, a lot to the world since uh, in the brief time I have to speak. I want to underline I completely agree with what uh, Mr. Vice President has said regarding the next decade and the next decade will decide compared uh, especially between China, the United States and Europe. And we in Europe should use climate change and that we have to meet climate change and deal with it and change it as an opportunity and as a chance, not something that threatens our competitiveness, but something that's an opportunity, uh, not only for environment, but also uh, for jobs, for the workforce, for economy, as well as for our societies, because climate change also means security risks, as Monica Langthaler has pointed out very clearly, and we have to convince people, as Monica also uh, said we should not remain in a bubble. It's the job of all of us to convince people that there are opportunities in meeting climate change and it's important also for our security. Thanks very much. Next is uh, Evelina uh, Vasileva from Bulgaria. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the key note speakers. Thank you for laying an emphasis on uh, the energy and uh, issues and climate change and the uh, energy union. Uh, climate change calls for an adequate and timely response, global response. Uh, this year is a key uh, year in respect of uh, the implementation of the Paris Agreement. In order to tackle this uh, uh, problem, we have uh, to take global uh, steps. Uh, that is, all countries should be involved. The European Union is leading in ambition for reducing emissions. At the same time, uh, we speak of 9.6 percent of the global emissions. Uh, we cannot expect the Union uh, on its own to cope with the problem of uh, climate change. The purpose is clear, fighting climate change and uh, to make a transition to a low carbon economy. In Bulgaria, we are working on a national energy strategy, which will be uh, endorsed by the end of the year with a plan of action for 2050. However, we need to be aware that the uh, low carbon development and fulfillment of poli the European Union policies will take a long um, time. It will be a long and complicated, complex process, which will cause for uh, reforming, uh, overhauling all economic sectors, uh, the economic specifics, the energy mix, and social um, social um, tolerance should be taken into account in this. The ambitious uh, long-term uh, aims of the uh, European Union is uh, a greater challenge for are a greater challenge for the countries uh, uh, with a low uh, uh, GDP, for which uh, uh, the uh, investment climate is. Uh, 
vital, vital importance. This is why we badly need support. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, next uh, speaker is from Slovenia, Smago Jelincic uh, Plemeniti. Hvala lepa. Uh, oba uvodna govora sta bila zelo zanimiva, vendar pa pogrešam. Uh, so, that was very interesting, but what's missing for me in two issues in both of these speeches, and these are uh, air travel, that's one industry, and also shipping, that's another industry. These are two industries which are at the top when you're talking in terms of environmental pollution. I would be interested to know what the European Union and other organizations are intending to do about these two areas, because I feel that these have been pushed aside. And I must ask myself whether there are perhaps very strong financial lobbies behind them. Thanks very much. Uh, next is Antonio Costa da Silva. Thank you very much. I'd like to touch on I'd like to touch on three areas which I think are very important, climate change, secondly, renewable energies, and thirdly, energy networks. Climate change has long since been here. It's currently being discussed. We must think about which measures we take when we talk about a two, year, a two degrees increase in temperature will have major repercussions. And just think about Portugal, people thinking about climate change when all of a sudden the sea sweeps through their houses, when we have major flooding, when the weather turns violent. That's when people think about it. The major fires we've experienced as well, that also has achieved a different a magnitude. And it's not just due to climate change, it's always uh, humankind which is behind this, because we know from scientists that these extreme weather phenomena will only increase. So it's shouldn't we perhaps increase our funding from this? This will be the case in Portugal. Europe needs to proceed uh, with a good example and not send the wrong signals. We think about the signal for renewable energies. We've seen very uh, many good examples in Portugal, but we think industry must do much more to back renewable energies in the medium and long term. Today we have new options to use low-carbon means, and we need to try and make these things more available and more affordable. These things must be available at competitive prices. That's what we must do for our civilization here in Europe. That's something the EU must support. As to energy networks, we must think in terms of European projects, because energy is crucial. We must think of the problems we face in terms of interconnectivity, the diversity and forms of funding. And how we can come up with projects which are not so in, uh, financially intensive. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, I would like to support the work of the European Commission on clean energy for all Europeans and congratulate them on this. It's a very major factor. There are three main axes around which this whole file, which is rather complicated, is built. First of all, climate change, then the place of uh, public authorities as far as uh, clean mechanisms for the market is concerned, and then the role of the member states and of the union. I'd also like to remind everybody of the importance that a cheap energy, which is accessible for everybody, which is the key for re-industrialization of Europe and the competitiveness of our industries has to play here. Finally, it is absolutely essential uh, to have a good uh, link between the national activities and the European activities. Every single member state, of course, is bound by the agreements of Paris, 
no doubt, but that has aims uh, for CO2, and that's not the only one, the CO2 emissions. There is an obligation to follow the aims, but it doesn't say how these aims are supposed to be achieved, so we will all have to try and make sure that there's good coordination between the member states because the decisions taken in one state will have repercussions on all the others, and you will understand that France, uh, which always uh, has this uh, type of thinking, as is quite uh, clear by the decisions of uh, certain member states, will follow these decisions with great interest. Thank you. So, colleagues, I have seen that there are more and more cases where we have extreme climate events. And for this reason, we have to act to restrict ga greenhouse gas emissions. We have to move towards clean energy. We can do that through renewable energy or via natural gas. Only in this way can we be successful. We, it is estimated that Cyprus will be able to make a contribution with research and exploitation of hydrogen, hydrogen projects, which we have uh, and uh, resources that we have in Cyprus, and this will be important for the whole European Union, and I think that that will allow us to succeed in managing without natural gas being delivered from countries outside of Europe. All the same, we shouldn't forget that Turkey is, uh, is um, creating provocation in this issue, and that's negative for Cy uh, Cyprus and for Europe as well. So we have to ensure that uh, we have solidarity in place so that we can react quickly uh, in order to be able to cope with these issues. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, Vice President Shevkovic uh, has to leave by 4 o'clock, so I would like uh, to give him the opportunity to comment on the first statements. Vice President, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, all the intervention, comments, and um, also uh, proposals. I think that uh, um, um, what was such a, I would say, silver uh, line going through all the questions mean that they've been touching on uh, the necessary or needed level of the ambition of the Europe in, I would say, the global effort, uh, how to combine this ambition with uh, our competitiveness, how to deal with the cost of the transformation, as it was mentioned by a Bulgarian uh, colleague, and of course, uh, how to manage uh, the sovereignty of the energy mix with the European ambition and finance this very demanding uh, transformation which is taking place uh, in Europe. As Madame uh, Westlund uh, highlighted, it's quite clear that uh, we have to come to COP24, to Katowice, well equipped, that we have to really work very hard right now, and I know that Polish presidency is doing it at utmost, that we would leave uh, Katowice with a very clear single rule book, which would really allow us uh, to make sure that uh, we are using proper tools and we can really assess the, the real efforts of uh, every party uh, which uh, signed agreement in, in Paris. We want also to present uh, to the global community this uh, deep analytical work which we accomplished uh, in the European uh, Union um, uh, upon the uh, invitation uh, from our heads of state and government, what it would take to take us to 2050 and uh, live in a carbon neutral second half of the century. And uh, we will present several scenarios and uh, of course you know very well that uh, it would mean that we would need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions between now uh, and, uh, and 2050 by 90 percent. 
If we would continue with the policies we just put uh, on the table and which are, I think, the most ambitious uh, in the global context, uh, and we would just uh, do nothing else and follow that path which we are charting for 2030, we would be somewhere at the 60% of the greenhouse gas reduction by 2050. And I think from all your interventions, which I heard, you all would agree that with the natural disasters, with accelerating the climate change, this would not be enough. So we have to have, a, I would say, more strategic, uh, deeper analytical look what would be required. And what we are currently analyzing are different, different paths, how to get there. Should we use more hydrogen? Should we base uh, uh, should we should we base our transformation on uh, more renewables? Should we should we uh, look for the amalgamation of uh, different technologies to bring us uh, to uh, that level? And I would say that based upon uh, these scenarios, you will see that uh, also the demand for the electricity production would vary from from plus 30 percent to plus 100. 50%. So it's really then up to us to decide in Europe how we want to proceed, how we want to make uh, this transformation possible. So we will start the debate with all of you, with the public, uh, with the uh, parliamentarians, with the, with, the, with the member states. So in uh, 2020, where we are required by the uh, Paris uh, Agreement stipulations, we will be able to present our long-term roadmap how Europe is going to respect its commitment, uh, to which we all sign up uh, in uh, Paris when, when, agreeing, when agreeing to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Paris uh, Climate uh, uh, Accord. And uh, it's quite clear that anything we do in this respect uh, would be very ambitious because all low hanging fruit been already collected and therefore now we have to go to the, uh, to the sectors uh, which been a little bit out of their reach so far, or because of the cost, or before, or because of the technological development. We have to do much more for in transport, in agriculture, in energy efficiency of our buildings. But also, we have to look what we can do in energy-intensive industries like cement, steel, and others, and uh, what kind of new uh, technologies we can use to make the uh, the, the the production uh, and uh, the increase efficiency in. Uh, in, in this uh, uh, sector. I think that uh, the approach we, which Mr. Mandel was proposing, let's look at it not as a unnecessary expenditures, which was, let's be honest, for, for many years the prevailing assumption when talking about climate change. And not only in Europe, because here I think we are uh, very much uh, forward-looking, but uh, across the world. But I think that now we are already at the stage when we see that the cost of renewables are dramatically falling where we see that Europe is number one in, in uh, patents if it comes uh, to use uh, of, uh, of the renewable energy. And when producing uh, for less and in a cleaner way is becoming not only the matter of the corporate social responsibility, but also economic advantage. So I believe that this should be the new look that we should have at investment uh, into this clean uh, transition, that what we are doing in Europe will have to be done by every economy on this planet if you want to save it. So be it in the United States or in China or in India or in Africa, they will have to learn from our example. And I believe they will also have to use our technology. So we should really look at it as a possibility to benefit from this first mover advantage and, and be proud of what we achieved and also be a little bit more assertive if it comes to the <laughs> trade relationship, if it comes to the different uh, development programs uh, uh, we, are, we are sponsoring, because I think that we have a, a lot uh, uh, to offer. As it was rightly pointed out by Madame Vasilia from Bulgaria, everything costs money. And uh, here we have several avenues to explore. The first one is that I think we have to be much better in uh, using our research and innovation money. As you now uh, we proposed uh, for the next financial period, for the next seven years, the biggest uh, funding uh, for our common research and innovation program, which will be called Horizon Europe. We proposed the funding of 100 billion euros. European Parliament just uh, made their proposals. They topped it up to 120 uh, billion euros. So this is massive support uh, for research and innovation and 35% of uh, uh, Horizon Europe should go to the climate-related uh, uh, research. 
But what I think we still don't do well enough in Europe, we can innovate, we can invent. We have the best lab and researchers on this planet, but we are still lagging behind our competitors in deployment of these new technologies. And besides the Energy Union, I'm also coordinating the, 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 the space policy of the EU. So I'm quite often in Silicon Valley. I studied at Stanford, so I'm trying to go back there every three, four years just to check what's new, what's happening there. And from one side, I am always extremely pleased, and from other side, a little bit sorry, when I discover that the 60-70% of people to whom I, I'm talking are from Europe. They've been trained by our universities, they started their scientific careers in our labs, they came up with the great innovations, but when the time to pass the so-called daily of death, uh, of death for innovators, for researchers came, they simply found the easier place to develop uh, the innovations in the US. They found easier access to money, the business angels, and this is what we have to change in Europe so that the innovation, innovators, and uh, all this value added which is uh, accomplished in, in the labs would stay here in the European Union and so that businesses could flourish from our continent uh, to other parts uh, of the world. For that, uh, we are also changing the way how we are, uh, how we are um, uh, ready to help uh, finance the projects. We have uh, the strategic uh, fund uh, uh, for strategic investment. It was called Juncker Investment Fund at the beginning. I was quite impressed that uh, within four years, we, uh, thanks to this project, uh, can uh, leverage almost 400 billion of euros of investment. And we want to continue with this innovative, innovative financing also in the next period and push it to 650 or, or more. We are working with the private uh, investors uh, in a way that if it comes to kind of borderline cases, we are ready to risk the investment and make it, make it easier for the investors to come and uh, invest. I had once in my office the representatives of uh, Green Banking uh, Association. They told me, Commissioner, we are representing uh, the assets uh, of the value of 13 trillion euros. I think somebody like me from Slovakia, I didn't know that uh, so much money exists on this planet. But the representatives of these assets have been in my office and they are telling us, please provide us with the good projects because we need to improve our shareholding portfolio. We want to invest in a, in a greener, cleaner uh, project uh, and uh, we have uh, to get a better information what is needed and how can we invest. So again, here we need to make better articulation, as it was said by Monsieur Bizet, between what is needed, what we can fund, and how we can really uh, create the proper, uh, proper conditions uh, uh, for that. For sure, the all technological strengths uh, will, be, will be explored. I mean, last week I was at the big uh, uh, discussion on Monday on batteries, on Fridays on hydrogen. And I think that uh, the challenge is so big that we would need all technologies to, to develop, to bring new breakthroughs so we can meet the challenge which is, uh, uh, which is ahead of us. And clearly, uh, these technologies look very promising for the uh, next decade and they will be proper reflected in that EU 2050 climate uh, strategy. Mr. Jelencic was referring to the aviation and, and shipping. I can assure you that uh, they are very much uh, on the radar screen and that uh, European Union is, uh, I would say, such a driving force to achieve the global change. There are global industries and unfortunately uh, we have to take into account that here we are in a global competition. But what we are uh, pushing for is the reforms of the ICAO for aviation, IMO for shipping, and I think that uh, the progress is there as well. At least in ICAO, we agreed that the emissions from the aviation sector should uh, peak by 2020. And then all the growth which is expected must be done within that peak which will be received in 2020, which would require a lot of innovation, which would require uh, new fuels, which would require new organization of traffic. And the same, of course, we expect uh, for, uh, for maritime shipping. The, the, the last uh, uh, comment I would make uh, to Monsieur Bizet, because he said 
that what is very important, I think Monica's slide uh, proves it very well, how the public authorities would behave, what kind of uh, public tenders we organize, how the mayors are going to organize uh, uh, the, the transport, in what type of technologies we would invest. And when I'm talking to the energy ministers, I always try to remind them, be careful what kind of power plant you are going to build. Think twice about uh, additional piece of infrastructure because the time is flying and you wouldn't like to risk the billion or hundreds of million of euros investment into something which might become in 10, 15, 20 years stranded asset. Therefore, we need proper planning. Therefore, we need these national energy and climate plans not only to properly reflect uh, the global ambition reflected in the Paris Agreement or the new European framework, but it should be the homework for each uh, member states and uh, their neighbors, how they want to fit into this new world, what kind of energy mix they would like to do, what kind of measures they are ready to adopt in all sectors of, of the economy so the country would grow, would profit, uh, would develop, and at the same time would do it in this European way where we can demonstrate that we grew since 1990 by almost 60%, but at the same time we slashed the greenhouse gas emission by 24%. And I think that uh, we are just going to open the Caesar even more because I believe that we can grow and we can reduce the greenhouse gas emission even more. So all this um, I think would be very important for the future, but I saw that I was talking uh, to real experts who understand how interwoven moderniza modernization, climate policy and energy policies are. And I really would like to thank the Austrian presidency not only for the great job they are doing, in making sure that all clean energy for all package will be completed by the end of the semester, but also for putting this very important topic on the agenda of COSAC today. Thank you very much. Vice, Pre Vice President, thank you very much uh, for your remarks. I uh, want to uh, assure you that uh, COSAC is supporting a clever and smart uh, energy policy and uh, the energy uh, union. Uh, we will have the chance to discuss uh, later this afternoon in the chairperson's uh, meeting our contributions and we will finalize uh, these contributions tomorrow in the plenary session of uh, COSAC. And there you will see that uh, some very, uh, not only idealistic, but uh, clever and smart contributions are done by uh, the members uh, of uh, COSAC. So, once more time, thanks very much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 So, uh, our debate will go on. Next uh, speaker will uh, be Mrs. Concepcion de Santa Ana from Spain. Thank you very much, Chair. Climate change is a crucial issue we have to address. We must be ambitious in the way we devise our policies which take care of the planet and help to improve the quality of life for our citizens, not just now, but for future generations too. In spite of the major targets we have ahead of us, Europeans are already the champions in fighting climate change. Bear in mind that Europe, which promoted the first global agreement on climate change, which was legally binding. We have to think about a low carbon uh, industry and economy. We have to think about reducing greenhouse gases by at least 40% by 2030 and keeping to the agreements of the Paris Agreement, promoting a clean economy, which Europe wishes to do, is a clear target for the future, increase the competitiveness of the EU, modernizing our economy and promoting employment for all Europeans. Europe must remain a leader. It must remain an industrial leader, in particular in the current political context in which major powers like the United States have decided to turn its shoulder on the planet. We are firm in our support of climate change. Spain signed the Paris Agreement and we're firm in keeping to the Doha Agreement when it comes to reducing greenhouse gases by 2020. One based on seeing the environment as an ally also in our development. I'd like also to mention the importance for Spain 
of renewable energy, something which relates to the Iberian Peninsula as a whole, the importance of which we've always mentioned to the committee, and I take this opportunity also to put this on the table. We believe that this matter should receive ab appropriate attention alongside renewable energies, single energy market, or energy efficiency. And in conclusion, we're at a crucial point in evolution of energy policy in all countries. Now, obviously, these exchange changes in emotions and incentives will have ramifications everywhere. We need to involve all stakeholders, citizens, economic sectors, scientific and educational areas, NGOs and the private sector in order to achieve the, the best results. So we need to move forward towards a union of, which is compatible with climate change. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, next is Atto Satonen from Finland. Mr. Chairman, it is very important that the Commission starts preparing a long-term strategy for low-carbon development because the present targets are not sufficient in order to meet the Paris Agreement objectives. Through this uh, objective, we can create our competitiveness, and climate policy is important in that sense. Uh, we need to to prepare for bioeconomy economy uh, in order for that to be competitive. It is also important to transit to circular economy and quickly in that. It means that uh, the, the all raw materials and uh, also um, end products and back uh, are a very important cycle, and that needs to be economical. The importance of forests need to be acknowledged. Uh, the Finnish uh, forests capture uh, GA, uh, uh, greenhouse gases, so they are they need to be uh, they need to be utilized in the future. Bioenergy energy needs to be uh, essential for renewable energies and how they are developed. Biomass, uh, energy biomass, side products from industry need to be used in the future as well. The next speaker is uh, from the United uh, Kingdom, uh, Lord Larry Whitty. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentations. Uh, they clearly show that we have to step up our activity on climate change. Whatever else happens in relation to Brexit, and I'm an unrepentant Remainer, but whatever else happens, uh, the United Kingdom needs to be part of the uh, European approach to, uh, to climate change. Uh, in terms of your targets, in terms of the emissions trading scheme, in terms of your agencies uh, delivering a, a, a policy and measures for not only changing the generation of energy, but also changing the way in which we use energy. So energy efficiency is absolutely central. Uh, 20 years ago, I was involved in the preparations for Kyoto. Uh, we're three years beyond Paris, but we're still off course uh, for meeting, uh, for avoiding one and a half degrees rise, which will be disastrous for the planet. I would just make a Europe is absolutely central to this argument. We have uh, the Americans opting out and in denial, and we have the Chinese performing ambivalently, uh, we have the Indians reverting to coal, uh, and we have the oil states trying to subvert the whole process. Europe is vital in keeping this, moving this forward, and our technology, our research expertise, uh, our driving force from the Commission and from other European leaders uh, will be uh, extremely important, and I just hope that the United Kingdom themselves and our industries and our technology uh, can help in that process in a way uh, which meets all our aims. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Elena Testa from Italy has the floor. Thank you very much, Chairman. Dear colleagues, I'm very pleased that today we're talking about this subject. It is a subject which is really important, as so many other subjects of this morning were. And uh, it's at least as important as Brexit and uh, 
climate change is uh, something which is really very important, and we cannot but underline how important it is to have proper policies in place for this. I think that at the moment Europe uh, is uh, looking at the subject in a very good way. We have major aims which we will have to achieve by 2050, and within the energy balance, we have also tried to come to a solution of all these problems. And we've said that uh, there needs to be a 50% uh, reduction of CO2 emissions by 2050. We have uh, the effects of this climate change very visible in Italy as well. You know that we had quite a number of emergencies there with, uh, unfortunately, people dying. Now, we have to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore, especially also in the areas, in the mountainous areas where the glaciers are withdrawing and where there are major changes in climate. So we have to make sure that we find uh, solutions that will help the future generations as well. I think it is also very important uh, to make sure that we have the proper instruments for the countries that have these major disasters and uh, to make sure that they can have uh, easy access to the solidarity funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Leo Drewach from Poland. You uh, yes, okay. Uh, thank you. I will speak a little from the Polish perspective. Uh, Poland as a country understands and appreciates proposed measures to reduce CO2 emission and to counteract the climate change. But this transition from coal-based electricity generation to new sources for us is not easy nor quick. There are two reasons, two main reasons for that. One is that the number of a new coal-heated power generation units enter into, into operation now. So normally, they will, they should work next 20 or 30 years. The second problem is a Silesia region, region which is much connected to the coal mining. Of course, it changes, but it takes time. So we welcome and we need very much uh, uh, all EU programs that are supporting transition regions and also programs for developing new technologies, including the CCS technologies, I mean the story, uh, capture and storage of the carbon dioxide. Uh, we need them and we expect, uh, we are ready to introduce them. Uh, in the next two weeks, uh, in Katowice, what was already mentioned, we'll start the COP24 uh, conference, climatic conference, uh, which is worldwide and which will discuss these problems in a, from the world's perspective. I think that it is a, also a good place uh, to discuss our position and our needs in this respect. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Maria Luis Albuquerque from uh, Portugal is our next speaker. Obrigada, President. Uh, Thank you, Chair. I would like to continue with what my colleague has said. He said that energy policy really must be implemented, above all, in cooperation between European countries. So the supply of, of energy has to work transnationally, because only then can it be efficient. And this is especially important for Portugal. The energy costs in our country are burdensome, both for companies, industry, and for also for private uh, persons, and it affects our competitiveness. Demand is continuing to rise, and at the same time, we have to ensure a level playing field for our companies in order that they can remain competitive and also to meet the expectations of 
citizens. And so this would be a good opportunity, I think, to win back the confidence of um, citizens in the European Union. This could bring the citizens to support the European uh, projects if they see that it has a positive effect. And for Portugal, it is fundamentally important that these energy projects from the European Union move forward quickly and can be implemented quickly as it's been promised. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Mila Peagies from Slovenia. Thank you very much. I'd like to refer to two things. When we talk about climate change and the energy union, let's not forget multilateralism and let's not look at it in a reductive way. Europe can keep its leading role by supporting others as well. This is the last stage, if you like, to devising a truly global approach. Also, when we think about climate change and migration, we need to think about sustainable development. All of these things are linked. Let's not look at this in too narrow a way. Development goals are important, and I hope that Slovenia will continue to build on sustainable development and Agenda 2030, but we have a major problem in the EU. On the one hand, policies are devised in such a way that there's an inherent conflict between states. We need to work together, but on the other hand, we are still competitors among one another and with the rest of the world. So we need to think about proportionality. When we try and see the EU through the eyes of ordinary citizens, then we need to remember the social union and the aspects of reducing poverty, both in the EU and throughout the world. Structural reforms in the EU will be important. It's not just a, a matter of the uh, awareness, raising awareness among the citizens. We also need to promote new technologies and innovation. Thank you, President. There is no doubting the fact that climate change is here and now. We've seen forest fires in Sweden to the north to Portugal in the south. During the summer, we had a very extensive drought, so that in Sweden, even in Estonia and Finland, I believe that emergency assistance was required for farmers. So it's time to raise the level of ambition in Europe so that we can reduce emissions even further and focus on transition to renewable energies, for example. I'd like to comment on what the Commissioner told us about the pollution from aviation. I do not believe that the Corsia system in itself is sufficient. It's about buying cheaper, unsafe emission credits. We need to fly less, basically. That's what it's about. And I agree entirely with what Monica Langtaler and Commissioner Sefcovic said about the benefits of transition. In English, we often talked about benefits of action. We can simply put, build better cities, creating hundreds of new jobs, having cleaner air to breathe, and we will have better public health if we raise our level of ambitions and rapidly reduce the level of emissions. And dear colleagues, when is a better time to raise the level of ambitions in the European climate policy than coming up to the international climate meeting in Katowice, COP24? Let's do it now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, from Portugal, Margarida Marquez. Please use the microphone. Thank you very much, Chairman. 
It's a great shame that Mr. Sheshkovich had to go already. But I have a message to the representation of the European Commission, and maybe they can hand it on to him. There's three points I'd like to raise. First of all, it is very important uh, to look at the environment, climate, and energy, and to leave these three points on the European agenda. And the discussion that we've had today shows very clearly that the national parliaments are very interested in keeping these three points on the European agenda. Second point, this has to do with the agenda of the United Nations for Development. What I mean by this is the following. The European agenda and the European aims and objectives have to become an integral part of the UN agenda for development. Third point, this is an aim, a European aim in connection with interconnectivity. If uh, we look at the map of Europe, we will see very clearly that this interconnectivity is extremely important and not just for Portugal. We have measurable aims for 2020 and 2030, and that in turn means that uh, if we get no support from the European Commission, then the countries of the Iberian Peninsula will not be able to achieve these aims. I might uh, remind everybody of the fact that uh, we have a forum for Portugal and uh, Spain, which is a parliamentary forum, and that forum has as one of its conclusions that we're going to ask the European Commission again to make sure that the aims of interconnectivity can be maintained. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to appreciate all Thank you very much. The achievements uh, of uh, Vice President Shevchovich in the area of the energy union. I'm very happy that he is uh, a commissioner from Slovakia who is fighting for a greener energy and the environment which is uh, about the future of our future generation. That is the most progressive uh, topic. I have three very brief uh, questions. Not every superpower has the same opinion on the environment protec protection. Here I'm referring to the Paris Climate Agreement, which was signed during the Slovakia presidency, and it was also signed by China, Russia, even Northern Korea. Uh, but. Uh, uh, the U.S. withdrew from uh, the Paris Agreement. What uh, can happen if the largest one of the largest pol uh, polluters has such an arrogant approach? Uh, the second question, in the area of uh, EU's energy pollution, I am interested uh, in the issue of sanctions uh, uh, on Russia. I would like to know how you reconcile sanctions uh, and on the one hand and Nord Stream 2, the Russian-German uh, project. We should either abandon sanctions and trade with Russia, or we should abandon the Nord Stream 2 project. These two things cannot be reconciled, and I would like to know what is the view of the European Commission on this, and I do not have enough time for my third question. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next is uh, Kelvin Hopkins from the United Kingdom. climate change. We have to act decisively across all nations to transform our energy production towards reliance on renewables. Wind, solar, hydroelectricity and insulation in particular have to provide for our future energy needs. We have to make that happen much more quickly than at present. Tidal power too must play its part. The state, but the state in all our countries must lead the way in achieving this vital advance. The market left to itself will not deliver and cross-border private commercial forces will not succeed. Private profit seeking does not work where massive front-loaded investments are vital and returns are long-term and social and environmental rather than financial. We cannot afford to abandon these investments as has happened with the recent cancellation by the British government of the tidal generation lagoon proposals in the River Severn estuary. <coughs> Solar panels on all our buildings and thorough insulation of these same buildings will not happen without state intervention and heavy subsidy. All our governments have to wake up and take the necessary action. That action cannot wait upon the uncertainties of the market and private commercial interests. P public ownership in the energy sector and state energy planning must pave the way ahead. It must be politically driven, not simply commercial. Thank you. Uh, 
The next speaker is from Lithuania, Virgilius Poderis. Thank you, Chairman. Dear colleagues, the most important aspect of the concept of energy union for Lithuania is that the concept en encompasses the synchronization of the Baltic states' electricity system with the European Continental Network as a strategic objective of the EU. Lithuania believes that the fully integrated energy market can be achieved only when all member states' electricity grids and systems are integrated into the EU's single electricity market and its systems. Today, the three Baltic states are still dependent on the operation of the, of the one external operator. In the context of the building of the energy union, the, the interconnection of the Baltic states' electricity systems for synchronous operation with the European Continental Network should be explicitly set as the objective of the whole of the EU and remain at the top of the highest political agenda. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much. Uh, the next speaker is from Turkey, Shafa Sirakaya. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. As it is known, Turkey is crucial for Europe regarding counterterrorism, for controlling migration, migration, as well as a stable corridor for transferring crude oil and natural gas to Europe. In other words, it's very vital for the energy security. Regarding the natural gas research on Mediterranean side, the one-sided action of the Greek Cyprus administration will lead to provocation and will not be accepted by Turkey. I have to point out that the Greek administration of the southern Cypriots are not the only inhabitants, but also the Turkish Cypriots are on the island. So as a guarantor country, it is the duty of Turkey to defend the rights of the Turkish Cypriots and also the rights as it is also the and, and, and also its right as it is also the Mediter Mediterranean country. The way should be as to find a solution which will be satisfy both the international community the people of the island, as well as Turkey. Let me, let me also say a few words regarding the climate change. So we are talking how we could manage the migration or illegal migration by fortifying our borders or just creating some island where will we meet those people. I think as long as the climate change won't be stopped, the migration towards Europe will go on. Thank you. The next speaker is Chirac Robel from Ireland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, in, in Ireland at the macro level, most of what has been said already here in the room uh, applies. We, have a, we had a citizens assembly look at the issue of climate change. They came up with 17 recommendations and currently a special committee is looking at those. But can I say that for me as an individual to take climate change on board, it took a three year old child. I had a, a, a structural fault as a result of a storm in my house and my three-year-old granddaughter asked me why it happened and I was explaining to her that it was wind and she then questioned why was the wind so strong now that it didn't happen before and we got into the climate change discussion and it brought home to me that at the macro level we can do what we want all the innovation all of the plans that government makes all the legislation they're all vitally important but unless the ordinary citizen on the ground questions what they're doing with the environment unless we question our use of our cars or use of coal fires unless we do that it's going to slow the process so I would say to the Commission today that if you're going to invest money, please invest some of that money in advertising to the citizens their responsibility as well as the nations, as well as the European projects, for it's the citizens that have to change their way. Most of us in this room were brought up in a consumer society where we never once considered what we were doing to the environment. Now is the time for us to get that message across to citizens. That's, that's my input for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Tadeusz Szymanski from Poland. So, colleagues, Poland is a reliable partner 
for the fight against climate change. We are and we will remain so. There's a lot of actions, a lot of programs in place, and we are also passing lots of uh, solutions to do with legislation in the areas of competitiveness and stability, and also with regard to the energy mix. We we have to have advantageous uh, changes in the area of renewable energy, and there's two, two topics that I want to uh, touch upon. So the, it's already been pointed out that the social relationships in certain countries, so there are some countries who have to base their um, energy use on tr tr conventional energy resources, and that has to be taken into account. So I'm glad that this fact has been recognized. We would like to ask for understanding in this process. So through the changes in the social circumstances and expensive tra transfers, we can't allow a very fast and very expensive changes to be pushed through. There, so we hope that in Katowice a great deal will happen, but this agreement has to be a global agreement. All countries have to be covered. In particular, the biggest polluters, without that, our hopes will be a naive uh, hopes. Thank you very, mu thanks very much. Uh, our next speaker is from the Czech Republic, Václav Hampel. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I come from a country which had a president which, who questioned climate change before the U.S. presidents. So I think it's very useful, a very good thing that the Czech Republic takes the issue serious today and takes part in initiatives which we hope will leave, lead to a solution. I asked for the floor at a time in the debate when I thought Commissioner Shevchovic would still be here. I wanted to ask him, but I'll put the question nonetheless to the room, even though he won't be able to answer. I'd like to know about the overall impact in the context of the free economy. The Commissioner talked about battery production. Now, of course, we'll need more panels, etc., solar panels. But the production itself takes energy, that's one aspect. And then it needs a lot of exotic, that is unusual raw materials, and extracting these can have great consequences for the environment. And then we have the problem of drinking water, because we need fresh water for these panels, for their production and cleaning. And the supply of water is already becoming a problem here in Europe. is from Slovakia, Jaroslav. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. And at the outset, I'd like to point out, or uh, rather, I'd like to uh, thank the Austrian presidency for uh, the following. Uh, besides important uh, political challenges that we are facing, it's important that we deal with uh, climate change and uh, the issue of an, uh, the energy balance. It is of key importance uh, for the good future of uh, the EU. At the outset, I'd like to say that the Slovak Republic supports the EU policy uh, searching uh, for uh, anything that can uh, substitute coal-based or carbon-based uh, energy. On the other hand, I'd like to uh, pinpoint problems that we are facing in the EU. And those problems are related to uh, the actual uh, application of this policy. Uh, uh, the, uh, in the time span 2010 to 2015, the European Commission uh, came with the idea of a green economy, that we should be using solar energy, wind energy. The Chinese responded uh, to uh, this request quickly. They started to produce solar panels that were uh, 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 much cheaper uh, uh, compared to either European or American solar panels. 
uh, uh, the Chinese increased uh, their tariffs by uh, 200 or 300 percent that were imposed on these solar panels. Uh, so the EU had to face uh, the following situation, uh, either be protective towards its own production or to uh, buy a cheap Chinese solar panels. What I'm trying to say is the following. Uh, on the one hand, uh, utilizing cheap technology from abroad. Uh, and if we are going to pursue this pathway, the technologies that are necessary will not, will not be present in the EU. If we wait uh, for uh, European uh, developers to come up with the technology, things will drag on. In other, in other words, we, are, we will be unable to protect our citizens in the period when we have to protect them. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Bernard Durkin, uh, Ireland. No, Mr. President, I think this is the most important debate. I think it's something that we all need to concentrate on. And to my mind, we need a massive publicity campaign to promote green energy right across Europe and to put it in such a way as to make it visible to each citizen so that every consumer in each country can look at a chart and say, this is my contribution, this is how it's working. As one who was almost a victim of the anti-wind energy campaign in our last general election at home, I can testify to the fact that uh, it, it doesn't come without its, its critics. And I would have to say that I still remain committed to wind energy. It is clean, it is available, it is, it is everywhere. And it is uh, possible for it to make a huge contribution to all countries and all economies, and particularly growing economies. In Irish, uh, green energy and wind energy is the best energy, and it's, it's more efficient, and it's available everywhere. The next speaker is uh, Sabine Delay from France. Thank you, Chairman. I think that we all know perfectly well that it's costing more and more if we don't do anything. We've seen that over the last 40 years. Climate phenomena in the European Union have led to losses, economic losses, of more than 40 billion euros. France uh, is trying to do something in this respect, and uh, we have made advantages, uh, certainly. There's a directive now at European level that uh, is uh, reforming the energy system. That's one of the three priorities that France has always defended, but we have even gone further. We have uh, tried to have a minimum level for carbon prices, uh, and that, I think, will bring more investment into energy production, especially as far as electricity is concerned. The same goes for the directive on energy efficiency. There again, France thinks that this increase uh, is not going far enough. We had suggested in the European resolution to have an objective of 40 percent. So we plead very much in favor of uh, more ambitious aims, uh, because that's the only way in which we will fulfill the commitments that have, we have taken in the Paris context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Anastasios Korakis from Greece. Thank you very much, Chairman. We think that, as far as energy is concerned, this is one of uh, the public goods that we have, and that is one of the reasons why this uh, special public good has to be protected by the governments. The Greek government made a number of proposals in this respect, and we think uh, that uh, this needs to be anchored in the Constitution as well. In addition to that, we would need to have policies and European incentives so that people don't uh, use as much energy and really start saving. Another point, in connection with the, the statement of the Turkish colleague, who mentioned uh, the exclusive economic areas. Here we have to say that uh, Turkey has to accept uh, public uh, law and uh, has to live up to it, and it has to stop uh, with its unilateral actions and activities which certainly threaten peace in the eastern Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the last speaker in uh, this debate is the first Vice President of the European Parliament, uh, Merit McGuinness. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this debate. 
Um, I think others have already said that while Europe and the Union will have um, agreed policies, it is the individual actions of citizens and businesses that will make the difference. And I do believe that there is a turning point, that people are now asking questions of their politicians about what we're doing for, for the climate, because we've had so many um, weather-related events, and it is a real concern for individuals. But we do need to give people clear direction, because very often there is a, a policy orientation which comes with a negative twist as well. So having um, clarity on what is the best way to proceed on energy in relation to climate is required so that the message is straightforward. For example, we had a recent report in that the air quality in Dublin was being impacted by wood-burning stoves. Traditionally, we thought this was not the case, that it only was coal that caused uh, air pollution problems. So people were beginning to wonder, could they ever do the right thing by climate? Um, so, and the next question, it was mentioned uh, only briefly, land use, agriculture, the contribution of all sectors to our climate actions. Perhaps you would make some observations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Langthaler. You heard uh, 28 uh, speakers uh, from national parliaments and also from the European Parliament. I uh, would like uh, to ask you to give us uh, some remarks uh, on this uh, uh, statement. Uh, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for listening to all these interesting uh, remarks. Um, first of all, I want to start that I, I remember quite well. I was, uh, my first climate conference was in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. So it was this big conference where we brought climate and the developing uh, policies together. And it was a, a key conference to accelerate uh, uh, the debate about climate change. And always, since 1992, the European Union was on leading this discussion. So I think Europe and you as European politicians, you really have the responsibility to stay in this lead. And I think it is something which not only uh, will benefit you in, 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 in terms of having a better environment, but also in benefiting Europe for having better economic success. So without Europe, we wouldn't have a Paris Agreement. Without Europe, we wouldn't have so many good already examples, best practice examples. And without maybe also the lead of the European Union, we wouldn't have the SDGs, and this maybe can, uh, refers a little bit to some remarks and also the last one, that it is not, uh, climate change is not something which only should be important for an environmental minister or an energy minister. It is something which is extremely important for each health minister and a politician who is involved in health policies or in agriculture, very much in agriculture, because agriculture will suffer much more as it did already. In forestry, of course, migration, foreign policy. So it, it touches not only each sort of policy field, it is a core aspect and it will increase. And one of the core aspects, and this has not been so much in the focus or to my opinion, not enough in the focus, is the financial aspect. So actually, every finance minister in, within the European Union so, should wake up uh, and really embed this topic of climate change in their speeches. And as it is something which, where you need an holistic approach, also every prime minister it should be on the top agenda of each prime minister. When they speak somewhere, this must be in the core of their politics. It used to be for the last years only a topic where I, I've been in the parliament as well. We had the climate change debates always starting at eight o'clock in the evening or maybe after some years at five o'clock in the evening where the attention was not so big. So it should be really in the core of all these other maybe much harder political fields, prime ministers, financial ministers, foreign ministers, and it should be something which should uh, be approached uh, in a holistic way. Um, another remark, short remark from my side, because there was one uh, uh, colleague who said, uh, what about all these alternatives? Don't they also need a lot of energy like batteries or other CO2 uh, or other uh, uh, alternatives? And I, I, I just thought of a book, maybe you, you heard about it from Thomas Friedman, who used to be 
a Pulitzer uh, writer, a, a columnist in the New York Times, and he just wrote a book, it's called Thank You for Being Late, and he, as you all are using your mobile devices all the time, I mean, I'm doing it as well, but I, I'm watching it for, it's something which is, had been, is changing. Uh, when I was in Parliament, nobody had that, you know? We have that, uh, it was invented 2007, Mr. The, uh, Apple was, was, was bringing that here on the market, and since then, we had a lot of innovation, and everything changed, communication changed completely. If energy efficiency would have changed in the same way as microchips changed in the last 40 years, you could go home, put fuel in your car, and drive forever, forever. You wouldn't need another stop at a fuel station. So this happened in just 40 years in the change of producing microchips. So one key aspect for us is innovation, of course, innovation. And who else than countries within the European Union and the European Union itself, and of course the United States, are doing it at the moment. China, of course. China is investing billions and billions in this sort of innovation, and Europe has really to do a lot uh, not to fall back. The transition takes time. It was mentioned by our Polish uh, uh, MPs here in the room, and they have uh, in very few days the COP in Katowice, which is extremely important. It's the most important uh, conference uh, for, for now uh, finishing the rule book for the Paris Agreement. It is, it's, it's really a key conference. And I know that for the Polish government, uh, the declaration about transition is key, and I think that there will be many countries supporting this declaration, and I think many, many European friends know that some countries need time, but that doesn't mean that countries are doing nothing. We all need to do something, uh, but of course we have to be aware that especially social aspects have to be also in our picture. And I, have, I really want to stress, and that is my last uh, sentence, uh, what the Irish colleagues said regarding communication. That's, I mean, what we always say, what Arnold Schwarzenegger says, every day you can have the best product in the world. If you can't communicate it properly, you have nothing. You have nothing. So go out, communicate in easy way. And yes, the European Union should do much more about advertising and really telling the people easy stories, very easy stories. And again, this year is a very elitaire bubble, the environmental communication is very much a bubble, so we need to go out from this bubble, that's why we are so happy to have Arnold, because he's a role model who can reach out to people from the sports sector, he can reach to people from the music sector, and from the filming sector, of course, and again, I hope I see many faces again on May 28, two days after the European election, we will have the next R20 Austrian World Summit to discuss exactly very much about the European elections and climate change and about communication. So thank you for having me and all the best for your future work. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank uh, Monika Langtaler for her commitment and her initiatives. Uh, I think we had uh, a rather busy day today. Uh, we had more than 100 speakers besides the keynoters uh, in uh, three uh, panels, and uh, we are coming to an end for today's uh, panel. So I would like to uh, close uh, this.